My friends, the American public and the American newspapers are certainly creatures of habit. This is one of the warmest evenings that I have ever felt in Washington, D.C. And yet, this talk tonight will be referred to as a fireside talk. Emotions were running high at the Franklin Field Stadium in Philadelphia in 1936 as the incumbent president, Franklin Roosevelt, prepared to take the stage and accept the nomination for a second term. Thousands of supporters awaited him, cheering. From absolute ruin in 1932, the American nation was on the cusp of recovery. Not a booming economy, to be sure. Unemployment was still at an unbearable 14%, but that was a far drop from 25% when Roosevelt had taken office. Bank failures from 4,000 to just 44. Detroit was employing thousands of new workers as Americans felt good enough to buy cars again. And for the many Americans that still received their income from agriculture and who had witnessed the nightmare of a drop from $13 billion in national farm income to just six in 1932. By four years later, farm income rose to $10 billion. Reason to celebrate. As the president approached the stage, what some of the people behind the curtain knew, but few in the audience did, is that the president could not walk that easily. He supported himself in a complicated way with his upper body and braces on his legs. He had his son Jimmy, or someone else often, take his arm, or on rare occasions, not in public, he used a wheelchair. The president, though, despite his debilitating disease, rarely lost his smile, that brimming look on his face that was almost second nature. This was true in front of and behind the curtain. Insiders describe how positive Roosevelt always wanted to make a joke. As he maneuvered through the crowd behind the curtain, He saw someone he knew, a poet he admired named Edward Markham, and reached out to shake his hand. But he overdid it and could not catch himself. Down he went, right to the floor. But then, as people surrounded him and helped him up, he said, Clean me up, boys, and went out and made his speech. In it, he attacked the economic royalists, businessmen, he said, who were still not supporting the New Deal. FDR referred back to a time when the nation had feared fear. Now, he said, we had conquered fear. The crowd and the nation couldn't get enough of it. It was a brilliant speech from Roosevelt the politician, truly the man the country had elected. Visions we have now of Roosevelt, the economic doctor, or Roosevelt the Keynesian, Roosevelt the liberal icon, these don't hold up so well to complete examination. The country had hired, in the crisis of 1932, a brilliant politician. And that's what they got. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. There are times when politicians are needed. And the 30s was one of those times. FDR knew what to say and how to say it. As he took office in 1933, the bank failures of Herbert Hoover's lame duck term were pressing. Far from just a minor slump, the country was facing total ruin as people wanted money from the banks and the banks couldn't deliver. He made this speech. Nothing to fear, but fear itself, he said. Helped to calm the nation. The same words that Hoover had said so many times, so many different ways, but never connected. In his first weeks, Franklin Roosevelt was successful in convincing panicking citizens not to withdraw their money from banks in large numbers, got deposits to rise. Even if he did nothing else as president, Roosevelt's presidency might have been considered a success in its first month. As a candidate, Roosevelt had played both sides of the equation. Not wanting to scare business, he promised to balance the budget, 
But he also promised a new deal for Americans and backed public work expenditures. As his campaign attacked Hoover for doing something and for doing nothing at the same time, Roosevelt had to be low on specifics about what he'd do. But this was not just for politics' sake. It's also fairly clear that if Roosevelt operated a little bit like a seesaw, it was because there was no clear consensus on what to do. Not from the country's experts, not from the Hoover administration, not from Roosevelt's own advisors. In a speech in San Francisco, Franklin Roosevelt, the candidate, said, The people are calling for bold and relentless experimentation. That was probably the most honest campaign promise that Roosevelt made. When he got into office, he made a variety of moves. He almost seemed to do everything at once, boldly. Some public works, hoarding gold, developing new pensions, cutting old pensions, and some federal spending all at the same time. Bold and relentless experimentation was what the nation got for four years. And still, in his 1936 re-election, though the well-known Social Security program was created, as were several public agencies, it still wasn't clear that Roosevelt had settled on government spending as the cure. In his campaign for re-election, he still campaigned once again for a balanced budget. And while he didn't balance the budget, it did reflect his thinking. The spending scared him and scared his advisors. At $8.4 billion, the federal deficit was as large as it had ever been in 1936. No one knew what effect this would have on the government. The federal government had acted so boldly only once in recent memory, World War I. And both Hoover and Roosevelt relied on that example, on the posture of an emergency or a war to guide them. In this way, their role as commanders-in-chief kind of clicked. And for FDR, this was, of course, all the more stronger. This was the model, the model of commander-in-chief in a war that would enable him to do extraordinary things and bully Congress. But World War I had only been two years for America. Now, it was 1937. The Depression was in its seventh year. It was no longer a quick emergency. And now, that $8 billion deficit on the books weighed heavy on Roosevelt, Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau, not to mention conservatives in Congress who were rapidly getting tired of the New Deal. Certainly, Roosevelt faced a different body down Pennsylvania Avenue than he did in his first year as president. When he called his first Congress to session early in 1933 in order to pass an emergency banking bill, many new congressmen, obviously elected on Roosevelt's coattails, didn't even know where they were sitting in the House chamber. The bill was read for the record, but copies of the first banking bill were not distributed. It made it very difficult to oppose the legislation. But the legislation came from the White House, and the Democratic Congress was for it. That continued in the early years, but now after five years of that complacency, more conservatives were elected to Congress, and some New Dealers elected in 1932 turned into conservatives by this point. Those who still supported the White House were getting a little tired, said one congressman to the White House, for God's sakes, no more controversial legislation. These were subtle feelings and vague discontent until Roosevelt, in an effort to stop having his New Deal programs blocked by the Supreme Court, wanted to add new members to that court, members he would appoint, which became the so-called Roosevelt Court Packing Plan. That was defeated, and war between FDR and these conservative Congress people began. The 75th Congress, elected in November 1936 on a platform uncompromisingly liberal, has adjourned. Barring unforeseen events, there will be no session until the new Congress to be elected in November assembles next January. On the one hand, the 75th Congress has left many things undone. For example, it refused to provide more business-like machinery for running the executive branch of the government. The Congress also failed to meet my suggest 
suggestion that it take the far-reaching steps necessary to put the railroads of the country back on their feet. It is here, in the hard times, when the New Deal faced its toughest test. It was easy in 1933, during the kind of emergency period when Roosevelt was a new president, to push through his hundred days of legislation. But here was the real test, the real moment for the New Deal. And Franklin Roosevelt here would make a fateful decision, one that would affect America in the 1930s, but would also affect our opinion of what he did. And I all know that progress may be blocked by outspoken reactionaries. But we also know that progress can be blocked by those who say yes to a progressive objective, but who always find some reason to oppose any special, specific proposal to gain that objective. Even to this day, as we enter a period of a financial crisis, an uncertainty in the markets, a slump in housing, and a downturn in the economy that is like others we experienced in recent memory, 2001, 1991, 82 even, but differs in this way. It seems more fatal. It doesn't seem controllable like the others. It feels larger than us. And when that happens, it's very common to do something that is not common for Americans. To look back to history. And skipping over those recent recessions and the hard times in the 1970s. The slump of the early 50s. And we go right back to the 30s. The Great Depression. Despite the amount of time. Despite it being three quarters of a century away. It is still the central event in the economic psyche of Americans. But do we know what we're doing? Do we know what we're comparing this to? Understanding the Great Depression is difficult for modern audiences, mostly because we have seen nothing like it. There were bad times, especially in the 1970s, where inflation was high, as was unemployment, and there were gas lines. There was urban flight. There certainly was a kind of depression. There were recessions. In 1950, 1954, 1960, the late 60s, 1968, 73, 74, 1979, and 80, 82, the so-called Reagan recession, 1991, which sank uh, President Bush's father, 2001, right after 9-11, but none of these meet the adjective great. The Great Depression could also be called the Great Economic Mystery. We don't really know exactly what caused it. There are about seven major theories for what caused the Great Depression. I'll go over each one. Theory 1. The stock market crash that occurred in 1929 drained the capital of many businesses. They could not invest, spend money, or hire people. Theory 2. A construction boom and a highway boom due to the automobile in the 1920s has re- had rescinded. It could not continue. There could only be so many roads built and only so many people could buy an automobile. This resulted in layoffs and excess inventory that started the Great Depression. Theory 3, a form of uh, Theory 2, but more general to that specific. It is that a boom must be followed by a bust. We had a boom in the 1920s, so it was time to pay the piper. Theory 4, The money supply had dwindled. Banks had no cash. Things dried up, and the Fed mistakenly hoarded cash, the opposite of what their job was to be. This is the economist Milton Friedman's explanation. Theory 5. Foreign banks, particularly German banks, failed, dragging American business with it. This was Herbert Hoover's explanation, at least for the duration of the Depression. Theory 6. A few layoffs and scared consumers perhaps scared by the fall of Wall Street and bank closures, stop spending, causing less demand and less spending. This is the Keynesian explanation, more or less. Theory 7. The 1920s brought a maldistribution of income between rich and poor. Money went so quickly 
from those who tend to spend it and those who tend to save it. Money went from the working poor to people who were as likely, when given extra money, to go to France in the winter, or to place an order in Oslo, as well as in Ohio, or just to save their money, something that economists call the marginal propensity to consume. So which one of these theories is right? What caused the Great Depression? Economists debate it, often with their own point of view and prescription for future remedies in mind. I wonder why we seek just one answer to the question. Perhaps one of these things caused the Great Depression, but perhaps it's just human nature to look for one reason. The old Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the best, but in this case it might be more useful to use a reverse Occam's razor and say the most complex explanation is probably the correct one here. It is probable that all of these seven theories, at least a combination of many of these theories, and maybe things that haven't even been thrown out there, caused the Great Depression. This is what the economist John, John Kenneth Galbraith called the perfect storm theory. Proof that the reverse Occam's razor, or the perfect storm theory, may be right on track is that all of these theories are a little true, but when applied as an ultimate, as the only theory that was the cause, they kind of prove false. If the stock market caused the ruin itself, when only 10% of families owned any stock in 1929, if it was the European banks, there was only so much of the economy that was international in any case. Construction slowdowns were enough for a recession, but it was just one industry among many. And if shrinking money were the reason, when money was unshrunk, when the Fed uh, got some sense and made money available to banks to loan, the banks were afraid to make those loans, meaning there was something more than just the availability of money. Maldistribution of income is harder to refute, but there have been other times in history since then where the rich have once again gotten richer and it hasn't triggered at least an immediate depression. Another hypothetical proof of the kind of perfect storm theory is that such a calamity has not befallen the U.S. since the 1930s. Of course, some of the reason could be the steps taken by the government, constant stimulation from things like Social Security checks, government employees and pensions, military spending, even in time of peace. It is very difficult, as we said, to know what the Great Depression was like. We don't have videos of the era. There were some films. And there were lots of black and white photos taken. Probably the one image you have in your head of the Depression is a black and white photo you may have seen. There were novels like The Grapes of Wrath. And we can look at newspaper clippings. We can hear interviews of people who suffered through this time. The memories are strong in the American psyche. Not only do we have Depression-era laws and agencies like the SEC, the FDIC, Social Security, Fannie Mae, the FCC, but the thoughts of the 1929 crash and depressions is tough enough to us and in the thoughts of so many. There have so, been so many points since uh, 1932, right after World War II, when there, the country thought there would be a Great Depression, in the 70s, in the early 80s, in the 1987 Wall Street fizzle, in the 1991 recession, always the specter of the Great Depression is raised. Throughout uh, research into political campaigns, I see very often the comment that a certain time or other time was the worst since the Great Depression. But none of these times the specter was raised did the Great Depression actually rear its head. And perhaps we can only hope it never will. Let us begin to understand, perhaps with some numbers, of the utter desperation that occurred during the Great Depression. It hit like the blows of a hammer repeatedly through the years after the Wall Street crash, 1930, 1931, 1932. From a nation that declared it had no unemployment in the 20s, it probably wasn't true, but unemployment was extremely low, perhaps 1 million in a population of 100 million. Unemployment came. First in 1930, 4 million unemployed. Then in 1931, 8 million unemployed. By 1932, 13 million, or about 25% unemployment. The gross product of the nation, and that means everything 
the nation makes from not just products, autos or steel, but also services. Imagine that being cut from 104 billion in 1929, about 80 billion in 1930, 75 billion in 1931 to 69 billion in 1932. Almost in half. Desperation. Welfare rolls overflowing. Foreclosures near 1 million. Steel production from 40 million tons to 13 million. Auto sales from 1.5 billion to 608 million. Retail sales 8.9 billion to 4.2 billion. Corporate profits 3.3 billion in 1930 to a corporate collective loss of 3.3 billion. In 1932. Farm income, 4.1 billion in 1930, 1.9 billion. Average family income from 2300 to 1600 in 1932. 9 million families had lost all their savings in the various bank failures that occurred. 1,000 local governments defaulted on their loans. In 1928, the hit song had been Everything is Hotsy Totsy Now. In 1931, The hit song was Brother Can You Spare a Dime. In Harlan County, Kentucky, there were bitter strikes as mine operators clashed with unions and blackballed organizers, threatening that they would never work again. In some farm counties, farmers got together and terrorized judges and auctioneers who were going to take property from farmers who couldn't pay their mortgages. We seem to be on the brink of revolution in many ways. Although President Herbert Hoover said no one is actually starving. Studies in eight cities found that he was wrong. Children were indeed starving. True, a child may not be actually dying of starvation as a root cause, although some of that occurred. But malnutrition was rampant. City dumps were raided for any kind of scraps of food. Farm laborers roamed the land for any kind of work that they could do. White-collar workers went for work in blue-collar occupations. President Hoover continually reassured the nation that the economy was fine and was going to get back on track. That people in the Depression had less hope was reflected by the fact that marriages went down from 10 per thousand in 1929 to 7.87 in 1932. Many marriages, an estimated million and a half, were postponed. Not surprisingly, childbirths were also down. 2.2 to every 1,000 to 18.4 per 1,000. Even the federal government suffered. President Hoover's prized budget surplus went from 734 million in 1929 to 2.7 billion in deficit as tax revenues dropped. This was desperation. States and localities devoted large parts of their budgets to relief. Charities went broke. 400 charities in New York City went under. These are, for the most part, cold, hard numbers and abstractions. Perhaps hearing some voices from the Depression era might help to make the point, help us understand. An Oregon newspaper asked its readers for memories of the Depression and got a bunch of uh, letters. Things were rough for everybody, said Marcel Holmes of Multnomah. I remember my dad walking to Portland, this is several miles away, with a jelly sandwich to look for work. Us kids went to school with cardboard in our shoes. There were parents deserting their children. Fred Nelson of Stabtown said, we would pick up bags of flour out of the river, bags that would fall off ships being loaded. The outer part, of course, was soggy, That part you couldn't use, but the inner part was good for baking. Helen Burnell said, Make do wasn't to save a little money. It was a matter of survival. I cooked and canned, cleaned and sewed, turned collars and hems up and down, relined coats and patched up sheets. So much that as an old person, Helen still stuck to her habits, saved little scraps of soap and used and reused foil. Another reader talked about how her father owned an apple farm and lived well, but apple markets dried up in 1931, and it was not worth transporting that year's crops to the markets. And that year the apples rotted in the orchard. But at least they, and this was a slight benefit to those who lived on farms rather than industrial workers did not have, they could at least eat the apple crop and did until debts to the farm had to be paid when her father lost the orchard. 
Another Oregon man wrote the newspaper talking about two students who had been coming to his school and each day got thinner and thinner and brought only a piece of stale bread and wore old raggedy clothes. Eventually, the teacher caught on to what was going on. Their parents had long since abandoned them, knowing that at some point they would be made wards of the county. A Kentucky newspaper looking for remembrances heard about a man who drove his car for as long as he could with no antifreeze, as there was none to have, praying that it would keep running. A store owner facing a bad season told his employees that we'd have to fire one of them. He would leave the room and they would decide which one would be fired. In the end, the two decided to, to take only half pay each so that both could keep their jobs. In Baltimore, a man described how his family lived across from a bakery, but still couldn't afford the bread there. The best that they could do is to line up at another line to get weak old bread and bring it home and warm it up. A Chicago woman talked about how her mom took in boarders at the family's tiny apartment to make ends meet, while at the window they saw jobless workers facing hunger, lining up to get an apple. A man who had a white-collar job talked of the day his wife cried, the first day when he left the house in overalls. A Brooklyn man talked about getting sent by his mom to get fuel, old wood boxes, or cardboard. His mother would send him other occasions with five cents to buy carrot tops from the vegetable store, and then to go to the meat store and ask for a bone for his dog. With the carrot tops and bones, she would make soup for four. A man in Detroit remembers how his father, a laborer, had no work other than snow shoveling. His mom, a seamstress, had much better prospects in the 1930s. Without her getting work in the Depression, the family would have starved. As it was, things were scarce. This was not an isolated example. Eleanor Roosevelt had said during the Depression, it's up to the women. And sociologists Robin and Helen Lloyd saw this change. As men were thrown about, a, sh a massive shift in their usual routines of work. Women, if anything, became more structured during the 1930s, to house, to family. They had to be. A woman in Williamsburg, Virginia described how her grandfather reached the point that he had resorted to stealing food. He hid near a farm at nightfall, waiting to steal a chicken. He was scared off by another man who, as it turned out, also came to steal the chicken. Both men ran from each other, thinking each other was the farmer. In Studs Terkel's uh, book, Hard Times, we hear from several Depression-era survivors. Jerome Zirk, who had a trust fund, and was traveling and living in Europe on his father's dollar. But after the stock market crash, his father wired him that his funds had dried up and he had to come home. Zerky described how strange it was having nice tailored clothes, the best clothes from London, but not being able to purchase anything new. I had the accoutrements of wealth, he said, but not the wealth itself. Fine tailored clothes that he didn't dare get a tear in. He wasn't the only one. A lost mitten was a family emergency. Socks and shoes were hard to find, according to many of the letter writers. Turkel's book talks of Blue Monday parties in some of the cities, rent parties held in apartments to pay the rent, liquor, booze, music, gambling, and sometimes prostitution. One woman talked about her mother's house, how it was known among the bums who would come around wandering. Her mother would always find something for them to eat. Soon she learned that the bums had a kind of system. An X marked in the brick near her apartment indicated that it was okay to beg there. Two million people during the Depression, it was estimated, were simply walking around the country looking for work or food. Hoovervilles, tiny communities of shacks that didn't exist before, opened up in Los Angeles, St. Louis, Portland, below Riverside Drive in New York City, and at the city dump, where residents picked through to find food, eventually just set up shacks there. In Red Hook, Brooklyn, a Hooverville in a junkyard. In New Jersey, under the Pulaski Skyway. Even in rural areas, such as Centerville, Ohio, where farms had failed, and men came to town to work, and there was no work to find, so they set up shacks. On the banks of the Tennessee River in Knoxville, villages of shacks spread. Eventually, they came to be named after the president. In Salt Lake City, charity commissioners 
said that scores of people were slowly starving. Children all over the U.S. who had nothing to wear were kept out of schools out of embarrassment. In 1932, a New York City couple moved to a cave in Central Park. While in Seattle, jobless families spent every evening without light as they could not afford to pay the bill and had no candles. In Chicago, a crowd of 50 hungry men fought over the barrel of garbage that was outside the back door of a restaurant. In Stockton, California, men scoured the city dump to retrieve half-rotted vegetables, newspapers recorded. A Harlan, Kentucky coal miner talked about eating wild greens, violet flowers, wild onions, and watching a cow, watching what the cow would eat first. Because, as he said, a cow won't eat poison weeds. Things were bad, really bad. But there were pluses, certainly, in the Great Depression and in the 30s. There was an increase in kind of a communal thinking, charity, thinking as an American people as a group. Families where possible to come together came together closer. People got more creative. They had to when times were tough. A newspaper article optimistically said, Many a family that has lost its car has gained its soul. Campy, perhaps, but not altogether untrue. Certainly, some people did okay during the 30s. Not extravagantly so, but okay. After all, if 25% of people are unemployed, that means 75% of those who could be working were still employed. Though some, perhaps as much as 10%, were only employed part-time. Prices were lower. One could get almost a 20% discount off almost all 1929 prices in 1933. Unlike today, oil was way down. Though for most, income didn't allow them to take advantage of these low prices, or their income was cut much more than prices were. But for those who had money, they could enjoy what today might be a $6,000 car or a $129 designer suit. The American fashion industry developed during the Depression as foreign designers just simply could not be had. Other crafty business people succeeded if they adjusted to the model of getting a little bit of money from a lot of people. An example of this, Howard Johnson's thrived during the 1930s, and the business was actually started during that time, the business of these roadside cafes. A Chicago fair developed out of the Depression, Thought it would be a total business failure. The backers put their money in and thought they were casting their money down the drain. As it turned out, hundreds of thousands would show up and the backers would make a fortune. A little bit of money from a lot of people. Some of the people interviewed in Studs Terkel's uh, interviews reported uh, that they had a little more time, a little more free time in the Depression. A boom is not all entirely a good time. Booms can be frantic. People are working harder. It's stressful in different ways. True, uh, that certainly didn't help if one was uh, starving, but some people who were making just enough money, the group of stockbrokers who had an order here, an order there, enough to keep them in business, and spent their days playing cards. Of another who took up music, and another person who began writing poetry uh, during the Depression when he had time. Door-to-door sales peaked during the Depression, and some were good programs, others were pathetic. More than a few people, though, survived the Depression this way. Multiple income streams, although it wasn't said that way, were a matter of survival in the Depression. It wasn't just enough to have one job. If you could have one job and then do some odd jobs on the side, that became important. Unions got stronger in the 1930s. Organized bargaining was enhanced, and the National Labor Relations Board helped unions deal with employer tactics. In the past, unions could just be thrown out. Uh, Members of unions could be blacklisted. The National Labor Relations Board helped with that. Entertainment flourished during the 1930s, especially movies, which were cheaper for people than the theater, of course. Arts in general through the 1930s flourished, especially under the WPA Writers and Actors programs. Like the Middle Ages in Europe, perhaps we devalue the 1930s and see it as a dark time. It was not just about that black and white photograph that we might have in the head 
or the story of the Jode family driving their vehicle through a dusty trail. Sure, it was those things, and people really did suffer. But it was more complex, and acknowledging that it wasn't the same experience for everyone, and that there were some good times among the Great Depression. We can't deny that it was a tough time for most. The politics of the Depression are not hard to describe. The complete repudiation of the party in power and the complete redemption of the opposite party, though it would take some time. With the stock market crash of 1929, there was no national election to be had that year. Herbert Hoover, the Commerce Secretary under Calvin Coolidge, a man associated with the successful times in the 1920s, was in office. He was beloved as a mining engineer, a millionaire before he was 30. He was successful. He's almost seen as a kind of Bill Gates at the turn of the century. He had run relief programs for Belgium after World War II. The thankful Germans named a street Hooverstrassen after him, as he also ran post-war relief programs. There was almost nothing that he couldn't handle. Both parties wanted him to join them in 1920. Hoover picked the Republicans and was considered for president that year. Envious were the Democrats. There couldn't be a better one, said Franklin Roosevelt, 1920. Hoover was not a full-fledged conservative, the same as uh, some other members of the GOP. Progressive might have uh, been used to describe him. He wanted free and universal education. He thought government should be the umpire of fairness, making sure that each winner had a chance. He was very well-rounded and popular, but Hoover even worried about the expectations as he took office. If some unprecedented calamity were to hit the nation, Hoover said, I would be subjected to the unceasing disappointment of those who expected too much. Prophetic words. Unlike today, there is little to compare the situation that befell the nation that Hoover ran. Since the 1890s, despite some economic trouble after World War I, the nation had enjoyed prosperity. The last president in a bad economy, Grover Cleveland, took no massive federal action. By comparison to Cleveland, one of only two Democrats to hold the White House in the 70 years since the Civil War, Hoover was an athletic president. But compared to modern standards, and compared to the contemporary thinking of what was needed in the early 30s. Hoover's presidential actions were puny. His first year in office, 1929, was not entirely unlike 2008. It was an okay year, but there was, and there was actually good, strong markets in certain areas, but there was a housing and construction downturn. In fact, the word used to describe it was a housing depression. And by the way, depression was sort of seen as a good word as opposed to a panic or a crisis. And it was the word that the government chose to use. And now that word has new meaning. But when one thinks of a depression, you might think of uh, a point uh, in a hill or on a graph where it goes down. But it almost certainly implies that if something's in a depression, that it will be coming back up. The Depression was meant to be a temporary description. When Wall Street crashed, Hoover continued to reassure Americans that the economy was sound. But he was careful not to say the same about the stock market. As the Dow tumbled from its peak in September 3rd, 1929, down to October 21st, when the, when the ticker tape fell behind for orders, on the 23rd and the 24th, the sell orders overloaded the market. And then propped up J.P. Morgan, a name that seems to rise again and again in American financial panics. It crashed again, finally, on Monday, October the 28th. 16.4 million shares changed hands. All told, 228 points when the Dow was lost since September 3rd, during what was not just a one-day crash, but a rolling series of crash, not unlike what we're having now. But in a sign that this was impairing the economy, the GNP during this period lost 9% between October, when the crash occurred, and December of 1929. Hoover could see the problem and urged businesses to 
keep wages high, not to lower wages. He also created two volunteer boards, presidential boards, for unemployment and relief. He backed up banks with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and encouraged something that he thought would work, a strong tariff to keep foreign goods out and supposedly to help American jobs. Economists, including a young economist, Paul Douglas, urged that the Bali Smoot tariff not pass. If they can't sell to us, Douglas said, they won't buy from us. But Hoover didn't quite get it. Constantly thought the economy was turning the corner. When a group of congressmen proposed a public works bill to Hoover, he resisted. Gentlemen, he said, you are 60 days too late. The Depression is over. The first political punishment was dealt in 1930, when Republicans lost 50 seats in the House. Because Republicans had gained such a majority, though, over the 1920s, they did not lose control of the House representatives immediately in 1930. But soon, in little by-elections, here and there, the result of a retirement here, the death of a congressman there, Democrats won each of these by-elections and took back the House. And John Nance Gardner of Texas replaced Nicholas Longworth as Speaker. But this was not an extremely radical step because Gardner and many of the Congressional Democrats at the time were conservative people. Progressives were found among both parties. With the support of Hoover, the new Congress under Gardner and the Democratic leadership proposed a sales tax, a step to balance the budget by charging a higher tax on purchases, which would hopefully in their conservative economics, restore confidence in the U.S. economy and make everything better. It was this point that the Depression had a third political effect. Democrats, along with uh, Republicans like Fiorello LaGuardia and George Norris, Republican progressives, revolted. People rejected the sales tax and filled Congress with an amount of letters they had not seen before. The sales tax was defeated. Later, this Democratic Congress struggled to act. A weak emergency relief and construction bill was passed. States could get aid from the government, but this wasn't like the New Deal that would follow with Roosevelt. States in this program had to ask for it. They had to basically declare bankruptcy and say they weren't getting enough in tax receipts in order to get any money from the federal government. And the accounting standards were very difficult to comply with. It was not a grant. By 1931, with two punishing years of depression, Hoover stopped making rosy pronouncements from the White House about the economy. And then the fourth noticeable political effect of the depression was had. Franklin Roosevelt was elected with a huge majority and with new congressmen that would be known as the New Dealers. There would be a fifth and sixth act too, perhaps a seventh. Voters would vote for more Democrats in 1934, and then they would re-elect Roosevelt in 1936. It would only be in 1938, nine years after the stock market crash, that the GOP would show any gains in a national election. And it can be said there was another more subtle political impact of the Great Depression. Even as Republicans made gains in the election of the 20th century, even as they would elect president, the name of Herbert Hoover served as a permanent reminder of GOP past crimes, a drag on the party. Only the word realignment or political earthquake could describe what happened in 1932. The Democrats erased the Civil War handicap on their party, and the Republicans gained their handicap, having participated or been in office during the Great Depression. From having only two Democratic presidents and just a few minor stints at controlling the, the legislative branches since the Civil War, the Democrats gained unbroken control of the House for 45 years and several tries at the White House. Roosevelt was swept into victory 22.8 million to 15.75 million for Hoover. Even Herbert Hoover, it turned out, managed about 40% of the vote. In the Electoral College, the margin was crushing 472 to 59 reflecting the changing political geography. Every state south and west of the Republican bastion of Pennsylvania was captured, and Roosevelt would win even Pennsylvania 
in his re-election. During Hoover's lame duck period, more banks failed and there would be more pain, only reinforcing the dislike of Hoover and the GOP party. Roosevelt would take office, call Congress into session, and ask for powers as great he would be given if the country, he said, were invaded by a foreign foe. So began the Hundred Days, everything from the banking bill to an agricultural bill to provide support for farm prices, to the NRA, which is a move, a private-public partnership kind of move to stimulate business and increase prices, but also at the same time a bill to cut, bizarrely for a people's champion, government spending, and $400 million in veterans' benefits. Something that some of Roosevelt's more conservative advisors counseled. He also took us off the gold standard and had the government try to hoard gold. If gold was controlled, he thought, prices for food or other commodities would rise as people wouldn't be putting their money into gold. Didn't quite work that way. The Hundred Days is remembered, like so much of history, as a blur. But it was not all of this or the other thing. The Hundred Days was a mix. Only Franklin Roosevelt knew what he would do, and congressmen in the first few years gave him a blank check that would be seen only in the early years of the Civil War during the 1920s with Wilson's first term and, one might say, with George W. Bush's early term. Such control over the Congress had not been seen. Mixed with these zigzagging steps, there was some relief, about $500 million, and a Civilian Works Administration, CWA, to provide some temporary work for people, so they are not just simply on relief. $950 million, most of that from the federal government, was provided for these projects. It's been said that Franklin Roosevelt understood people because of his handicap, that he had compassion for the average man, for people who were in trouble. I think there's some element of truth to this. It certainly made him not blind to the average man or to a man in a bad situation, as he really did have a bad situation of his own and suffered greatly and overcame quite a bit. Roosevelt was still mainly a political man, a great political actor with a wonderful political mind. And he leaned towards the conservative and timid approaches. But of all the approaches he took, The CWA created 4 million jobs, put hundreds of millions in the economy, and reduced unemployment. Roosevelt would introduce other timid steps, especially in 1935 and 1936, after he received a larger majority in the congressional elections of 1934. The WPA was a long-term type of CWA. The, The Civilian Works Administration was just a temporary program. And, of course, Social Security, which would have the benefit of both putting some money into the economy and hopefully opening up jobs as older people left jobs they had since they did have some backup. Memoirs of the Depression are filled with the moments when CWA, PWA, or WPA checks came into the towns and cities and commerce was restored. By 1935, several of the key economic stats had improved. GNP, adjusted for population, had sunk to 69% of its 1929 level by 1932. It was now up in 1935 to 90% of the boom year of 1929. Stock prices that in 1932 were a mere 25%, one-fourth of their 1929 level, We're now at 41%. Not good, but especially considering 29 was a crazy boom year for the stock market, it wasn't bad. Unemployment from the horrific level of 25% was down to 14. Again, not perfect. Still a lot, still millions of people unemployed, but better. Do not let any calamity howling executive with an income of $1,000 a day who has been turning his employees over to the government relief rolls in order to preserve his company's undistributed reserves, tell you, using his stockholders' money to pay the postage for his personal opinions, tell you that a wage of $11 a week is going to have a disastrous effect on all American industry. 
fortunately for business as a whole, and therefore fortunately for the nation, that type of executive is a rarity with whom most business executives most heartily disagree. A book by John Maynard Keynes, British economist, said, this is all a part of a natural process. Government had spent, government needed to spend. In fact, by the predictions of Keynes, FDR's step were small, almost inadequate, a few hundred millions in an economy of a hundred billion. But Keynes's book was just theory, and Franklin Roosevelt was not as commonly suggested. A huge believer in Keynes, he did meet him, some of his advisors would cite the book, and it did provide a sort of intellectual support for taking greater actions with government in the economy. But FDR wasn't totally convinced. The question that puzzled FDR, his advisors and others, was, even though the economy was getting better by 1935, 1936, was this phantom money? Was this phantom gains? Borrowing money, increasing some taxes to make it all seem like the economy was going along when really it was just the government forcing this economy to make it seem like the economy was improving and to stop the real rough effects of starvation, which anyone could support, of course. But were things really getting better? There were still homeless, unemployed, still garbage dunks, garbage dump scavengers and apple sellers on the street, but there was less of them. People were making do, buying a little now. And whether it was improvement in the economy or just the fact that they couldn't get by anymore stretching along their, their durable goods, sales of things like autos, radios, and clothing increased as people had to seek replacements. But still the question, was this improvement in the economy real or fake? In 1933, the economy improved in the summer but dried up by the winter making it seem like that government spending was nothing more than a little sugar. And once it dried up, the crash came back. And with all this spending, could perhaps leave the economy in worse shape, more in trouble. A few stats more visible with hindsight than to FDR at the time probably would have st told the story clearer as to whether the economy was a phantom economy or not. If government is just a jump starter rather than a wheelchair, after the government spending, private investment should take over. With the bank scares of the early 30s, Franklin Roosevelt's actions enabled banks to get healthy on their own. He guaranteed banks, created the FDIC, but he never needed to start, as had been started in, the early, in early America, a bank of the United States. If we look at 35 and 1936, we see the construction, which dropped from $8 billion to 1929, to just a little over $1 billion in 1930, was now at $3.3 billion. No boom, but improvement. Business purchases of durable equipment, industrial machinery equipment, that sort of thing, went from $1.5 billion in 1933 to $4 billion in 1936. Federal receipts is another indicator. These are useful because they are a direct result. Looking at the construction industry and looking at business purchases of durable goods is a great uh, useful statistic because they are not the direct result of government spending. Federal receipts is another indicator. How much money is the federal government taking in in taxes? From $3.1 billion in 1930, federal receipts went down to $2 billion in 1933. There were less people making income the federal government was taking in less in taxes. But by 1936, the federal government took in $4 billion, and unemployment and GNP numbers at this time are also showing improvement. We know that there were 4 million jobs created. GNP was $95 billion, not the $104 billion of 1929, but in 1929 dollars, that was $91 billion. We know that there were 4 million new jobs created through the CWA. And that would explain part of the unemployment being reduced. But unemployment was reduced by double that number of new government jobs, meaning that private industry had to be picking up some of the slack. In every measurable way, happy days were here again. Still trouble, but happier. 
And so Roosevelt would take the stage at Franklin Field Stadium in Philadelphia and make his renomination speech. And then he would go on to win the election of 1936, beating Governor Alf Landon of Kansas, winning every state in the Union except for Maine and Vermont. Yet Roosevelt's second term was not cheery. He was stymied in his plan to pack the court, to increase the size of the court, to get around the blockage of New Deal legislation. Conservative senators, such as Millard Tidings of Maryland, Pat Harrison of Mississippi, Josiah Bailey of Montana and Pat Caron of Nevada, all Democrats, opposed the New Deal. But the pressure wasn't just external. Internally, Roosevelt and some of his conservative advisors were bothered by the deficit, looming at $4 billion and rising, an incredible sum at that time. His conservative advisors, Bernard Baruch and Henry Morgenthau, advised for retrenchment in federal spending. With hindsight, we can see that while Roosevelt certainly needed to be worried about the deficit, deficit spending in 1936 was actually less of a percentage than it had been under Herbert Hoover in 1932. It was 59% in 1932. That means 59% of what the government was spending was borrowed money. And in 1936, even though Roosevelt had increased the size of the government and the scope of what it did, and increased relief programs and created public work programs, Federal government was spending just 52% from the deficit, 52% borrowed spending. By 1939, he actually got it down to 42%. This was because tax revenues were increasing. During Herbert Hoover's time, less tax revenue was coming in because the depression was so severe. Deficit spending is not always the hobgoblin that it appears. But that's us with hindsight. And at the time... The deficit scared Roosevelt, and he complied with his conservative advisors and cut back. In 1937, New Deal programs would be cut. No new initiatives would be launched. A cut of $2 billion in federal spending was made between 1937 and 1938. To make it all worse, this was a time when we were collecting more in taxes uh, from for Social Security programs. But Roosevelt was insisted, the patient, Roosevelt said, referring to the country, needed to throw away the crutches. Spending was slashed, and those uh, with government loans on their houses, many of them got foreclosed, relief was cut, WPA programs was cut. By virtue of doing this, Roosevelt cut deficit spending to just 17% of all federal spending. This was the zig to Roosevelt's New Deal zag, and as a political move, he thought he could get away with it. He thought that confidence would return and business would take over. So there were political benefits. It would make the conservatives happy. But also, if, just if, there was something to this theory that a huge deficit was going to ruin business, Roosevelt had cured it. Instead, a recession occurred. In August of 1937, stock prices just inexplicably started dropping. Unemployment rose five points to 19%. And auto sales were cut in half. Detroit workers were sent home. Construction retracted from $4.4 billion in 1937 to 3.9 by 1938. Purchases of durable equipment dropped from $4.9 billion in 1937 to $3.5 billion. National income is almost 50% higher than it was in 1932. And government has an established and accepted responsibility for relief. But I know that many of you have lost your jobs or have seen your friends or members of your families lose their jobs. And I do not propose that the government shall pretend not to see these things. In 1938, this was a reverse momentum that was devastating for Roosevelt, his administration, and very hurtful for his place in history and the place in the New Deal in history. GNP dropped from $96 billion in 1937 to $90 billion in 1938. Every other major indicator went down. Farm income, wages, stock prices dropped. It is going to cost something to get out of this recession this way, but the profit of getting out of it will pay for the cost several times over. Lost working time is lost money. Every day that a workman is unemployed, or a machine is unused, or a business organization is marking time, 
It is a loss to the nation. Roosevelt was angered. He blamed business, the Liberty League, conservatives in Congress. He insisted business be investigated for conspiring to undo the New Deal. If you think back to the experiences of the early years of this administration, you will remember the doubts and fears expressed about the rising expenses of government. But to the surprise of the doubters, as we proceeded to carry on the program, which included public works and work relief, the country grew richer instead of poorer. But in spring of 1938, his more liberal advisors, Felix Frankfurter and Harry Hopkins, would convince him to agree to a $3 billion spending program, the largest ever. Between 1938 and 1939, the effects were immediate. There would be dramatic improvement. GNP rose from $90 billion to $96 billion. Uh, unemployment shrunk. Construction rose by a $1 billion. Purchases of durable equipment by businesses by $500 million. And so it is here in the Roosevelt Recession, as the press called it, and the 1939 recovery, as one might call it, wasn't really called that at the time, that I wish to focus on. Because it is the most important event related to the question of, did the New Deal work to cure the Depression? Or was it just as a phantom program? A little sugar for the children while America really suffered. It is true that the national debt increased $16 billion. But remember that in that increase must be included several billion dollars worth of assets which eventually will reduce the debt and that many billion dollars are permanent public improvements. Schools, roads, bridges, tunnels, public buildings, parks, and a host of other things meet your eye in every one of the 3,100 counties in the United States. A program that was a political hoax, perhaps, covered by World War II. His 1944 opponent, Thomas Dewey, would even suggest that. The Democrats had no real program in the New Deal. It wasn't working. And only World War II was improving the economy, and Democrats were actually seeking to stretch out the war to cover up what they had done. But the post-World War II era turned out to be a one of prosperity for Americans as we emerge as a global leader, builder, and supplier of goods. So it doesn't do well to compare the World War II and post-World War II period to the 30s to answer the question of whether the New Deal worked. To answer that question, I'll ask a new one, and I'll speculate a bit. What if FDR hadn't curbed the pump-priming spending in 1937? Well, it's speculative, and it might be hard to follow verbally without a chart, but if I take the rate of improvement that occurred between 1933, when Roosevelt took office, 1936, his re-election, the average growth there, and applied it to certain statistics for the period between 1937 and 1938 when spending was cut. And we sort of say, what if? I see some interesting things. If we look at construction, instead of shrinking in 1937 by $500 billion, it grows $5.3 billion in 1938, and by 1939, it's at $6 billion. It's not the boom of 1929, but it's good. Durable equipment purchases, instead of shrinking by $600 million, actually would then grow to $5.7 billion had there not been this recession in 1938. And that beats the boom year of 1929. No doubt you will be told that the government spending program of the past five years did not cause the increase in our national income. They will tell you that business revived because of private spending and investment. That is true in part, for the government spent only a small part of the total. But that government spending acted as a trigger, a trigger to set off private activity. Unemployment, Stock prices, all of these would recover dramatically. For stock prices, they would have risen to 60% of their value by 1938. The opinion of most economists looking at the situation is that the Roosevelt recession would not have occurred. 
And in my analysis, had that recession not occurred by 1939, before the U.S. had entered World War II, America would have experienced full recovery. Not a boom, but full recovery and a lot less pain. Politically, had Roosevelt persisted, there would have been no question in the future about the New Deal, instead of the kind of mixed bag that it has today. I think I have to make a point here. You'll notice in the last passage, my language has been conditional. If this had occurred, then this would have occurred. If the spending had not been cut, we would have had recovery. And of course, that's going to be subject to the argument of, well, how can you say so? We can't travel back in a time machine and say uh, what would have happened. And of course, we realize this. I would make two arguments to why this speculation is right. One is that it is the clear cause and effect. There's at least correlation. The government spending was increased and the economy bloomed. And the economy bloomed beyond just that government spending. The government spending was then cut and then there was a sharp recession. It's at least the correlation. Secondly, I think the cut was large. We went from 52% to 17% of deficit spending. If perhaps there had been a more moderate cut, maybe we wouldn't have seen this effect so profoundly. A lesson was learned from the New Deal experiments in this respect. While not everyone listens to Keynes at his word. Someone like a Keynes wanted more than just the $3 billion that Roosevelt spent in an economy of $100 billion. The government cannot sit still. It has to be a very active partner when times are bad. But it has become one of the clear lessons of the Great Depression and the New Deal. Immediately, when a large crisis occurs, eyes, even business eyes, even Republican eyes, look to the government. The few voices that cry socialism. In my view, the New Deal, if there was an equivalent program to it done in 2009 would be the no big deal. A program to create jobs for 10 million people is totally in the realm of possibility. It might not be being done today, but in the future if the downturn persists. And that would be about the equivalent of what was done by Roosevelt. We already have unemployment checks entering the economy and social security checks something that only appeared in the later 30s and in far less numbers. And unemployment has been fairly extended, uh, fairly easily extended each time Congress is asked to do it during a recession. None of us know the example of the Great Depression, really, except in black and white photos. What we have to ask ourselves is, will this downturn be Great Depression bad? That is an open question. But we do know this, it's a very high bar.